and the agents provided if you have enough energy left to look at it. After, after having the problem to try, I think the agent will be completely exhausted and ruled. But still, if you are able to maintain your sanity, you will be able to see this. And then, as it starts moving, you will have a uh, snow, uh, we will look into the issue of what are the different features in subsequent slide, but it is slowly moving down the line. So you have a snow, uh, you have a, this region which has a snow, which is eventually converted into the metamorphic process into the ice, and then it is moving down the line. But as you move further down, you have old snow and it comes down, and this is called the terminus of snow. So, you have older snow, so if it is formed on the top, it goes into the bottom and then comes up, and at the end it comes up near the terminus or a snow of the glacier. So, you have older snow over here, then some snow which it gets converted into ice, it remains on top and it is here. So, you have now a situation where certain portion, then the snow, and it moves down snow thickness at the end of some the reduces and it ends here and then ice is exposed on the surface. Mm -hmm. You can see we will put this issue then later on. Uh, and you will have this situation and on top of that uh, you also have uh, uh, something sometimes depending on geography you can have a lake which is formed at the bottom and which is called Morendan Lake. And you can also see that the <coughs> you can also see that there is snow uh, also forms on it and it makes a So if there is a winter time, the entire region is covered by single snow. So you don't know where the snow and where it dies. Hmm? So you require a time when this is no snow is completely melts and things are things. It said, and when the ice is exposed on the surface, it means you need to choose the satellite images when the seasonal snow is distributed. So that ice is exposed on the surface, and when the ice is exposed on the surface, you will know whether it is snow or whether it is uh, ice, or whether it is a glacier, or whether it is seasonal snow. That way. So, selection of the satellite images is a key if you really want to use. Remote sensing for glacier If you select the winter, you will not able to identify glacier. So it is necessary to select a time when glacier seasonal snow is retreated maximum. So what is that we have already in this year this is that glacier is a mass of ice slowly moving down the gradient uh, and glaciers normally contain ice, water, snow and rock debris. You remember? Particularly in Himalaya, uh, you will see some of the slides that show the significant, significant amount of debris that are deposited on the glacier ice. Mm -hmm. And as they move along the glacier ice down the valley, the moving debris are called moraine. So they get pushed towards the side, so you have a lateral moraine and they come towards the side, and as they come near the terminus, they call the terminal moraine. And that is the one which is used extensively to map past history of fish. So remember the other important thing. So out of this, ice is the essential component, uh, and glaciers are normally formed in a decrystallization and metamorphism of naturally fallow snow on land surface. We have no break the issue. Uh, so now you know, let us look into this how the glaciers can be broadly classified as ice sheet and high glacier. So what is this? So you have a large, like a green land, an entire uh, large landmass or entire Antarctica which is covered by the glaciers. And uh, it's mass is so large, its geographical area is a millions of square kilometers, and therefore they are called the ice sheet. Hmm? And what is that ice sheet are about? Its thickness is so large, the underlying topography which you will have. It has no influence on movement because irrespective of whatever is the topography, underlying topography, land topography, 
eyes will move because of visual volume on the screen. Hmm? So when the topography doesn't influence the movement of the glacial ice, and if size is too large, then it is called the ice shape. But on top, however, in a way like the Himalayas, uh, where our glaciers are not directly at Greenland or Antarctica, and the topography defines the extent of the glacier. And even if you have it appears to lie on top of it, if you look at the satellite image, you may feel large geographical area is covered by glacier, but actually they are controlled by topography. It means one glacier is going this side, another glacier is going another side. So the topography which defines the movement of glacier, and therefore they are called the high glacier. So uh, and movement is by the glacier. So, so that is what we are saying. <coughs> Yeah, and top of that, it is the glaciers are mostly vanitized, we have discussed that the glaciers can also be classified on the basis of temperature. What really happens to temperature inside the ice pack? Remember, as, uh, as uh, what will happen if you have an ice and you put pressure on it? What will happen to its melting point? Yeah? So, it will decrease them. So you will have, as you have ice thickness, which is sometimes kilometers, sometimes hundreds of meters, like the Kangutri glacier or other glaciers have 300, 400 meters, Antarctica kilometers. So it, it's got a tremendous pressure at the bottom. And because of that, you have, as you move down, you will have, uh, what happens is, uh, the melting on the surface, and as it melts on the surface, that water penetrates inside the ice, and it penetrates inside the ice, and the temperature is below zero degrees Celsius, it refreezes, that water refreezes, and if it refreezes, it gives enormous amounts of detergent as they change in phase from water to ice, and again, that ice temperature comes to the melting point. So what happens is, uh, many glaciers in Himalaya are at pressure rating point. Mm? And if your ice is at pressure rating point, that means as you move down, it becomes slightly more negative. So what will happen? If at the bottom of the ice, if ice is moving, mm, it creates a friction again. As well as, there is a lot of Geothermal heat is also there because atmospheric temperature may be below freezing, but land surface because of geothermal heat is also very close to zero degrees Celsius. You now have a situation where the energy is transferred because of the friction and because of geothermal heat uh, to the ice. But ice, because of the reverse temperature, cannot. Uh, dissipate it backward. Hmm? So it creates the energy trial at the bottom. And because of that, the bottom of the all temperate glaciers is at pressure melting point or in liquid water. So what it does is that it, so on the basis of whether it is cold glaciers or it can be called temperate glaciers. The many glaciers in Antarctica, there is absolutely no surface melting. Our last part in Greenland, there is absolutely no surface melting. Now it is started, but we are not going to that issue. So if there is no surface melting, then, then the ice doesn't come under pressure melting point. And if it doesn't come under pressure melting point, such glaciers are called a cold glacier. And if they come under pressure melting point, they are called the temperate glacier. So this is, and that defines with different way the way glaciers are going to move. Uh, and we already discussed, and because of the, this temperate glacier, therefore the pace of it is always liquid. It means they will move faster. And it creates very different geomorphology and it creates very different dynamics for the glacier. Hmm? Therefore, you would have seen in past when, uh, when there was some discovery of fast movement of ice in Antarctica, people thought it is a major disturbance. Because suddenly it means that the possibility, if suddenly ice start moving fast, it 
me this is possibility that there is a liquid at the bottom and because of that the friction gets reduced. So people thought it is a discovery. But this is the fundamental science behind it. So let us look into what are the different features of glaciers and where we can use remote sensing to identify this thing. Because we are here talking about the remote sensing of snow and ice. So let us go into the area. We already seen that we have, like, now we are moving from Antarctica or Finland towards the Himalaya and we will concentrate on Himalayan glacier to understand how, uh, how we can use remote sensing to understand Himalayan glacier. So you have a predominantly that type of glacier uh, in the Himalaya. And you can see you have one side which is completely covered by rocks and another side which is covered by uh, another glacier. So, Manhattan glacier is coming this side, another glacier is going to the other side. And you have a neighboring glacier that in between this, this is called the ice divide. That, that means glacier ice is flowing on the side and this side. Uh, then, then what will happen is you have this, uh, this small line about which we were talking about earlier is active versus inactive ice. That means this much region which will have a snow on surface, but it is not the part of the glacier. Hmm? So it is very important for us to know that uh, where this glacier starts and where. So this much area, predominantly, you will classify as a glacier by that. And this much area, many of you other day was asking me that why uh, the area extent we estimate by using satellite images is a different than what is given by ground. Somebody was asking. So this could be one, I'm not saying this is only, but this is, could be one reason why you will identify uh, this much portion which is not as a glacier where classical glacier or this will not identify this geographical area into glacier, but remote sensing interpretation normally people may add this much area. And that could be the one source of error. There could be other sources of error about which we will talk next on as we move towards the interpretation of that image. The another thing is going to happen is uh, there will be a uh, peaks in between the glaciers, which will come and you will see. So there will be a uh, huge peaks in between the glaciers, so which will not die to the top. But what will happen is uh, there will be no space in between the rock. Uh, it means that you have uh, the faces where solar radiation is coming and hitting in the morning, and which will have, because of the low level of the rocks, it will absorb a lot of energy and night time completely freezes. And because of the large temperature difference between day and night, whatever the water which is trapped inside will freeze and it will also bend and get exert a lot of pressure on rocks and rocks will start falling down. And they will fall down over here and the moment they fall down with the ice they will start moving. And the moment they start moving they form the moraines. Hmm? So then it is called moraine. So whatever you see here is nothing but, and since it is the middle of glacier, it is called a medial moraine. Hmm? Because it is the middle, it is only that. And the moment they are pushed to the uh, sides of the glacier, they are called the lateral moraines. Uh, there is nothing big deal in that. And you can see here that whole period of time when the glacier was on a peak, it, it is reflected in its geographical lateral boundary also. And you can see once the glacier was up to this point, yeah. and now it has gone to a shifted eastward because its thickness has reduced. Hmm? And you can see here, uh, this you can see in the geographical area which was in past. We don't know when it was, but we definitely know when there was a peak of glaciation. Glacier had a much larger geographical area than today, and its point is marked at the at the right point. And you can see very clearly some of the subsequent such field photographs and satellite images I can tell you clearly how it looks like. But this is known as natural moraine, and this is where the past glaciation can enter. So historically, uh, people have used 
uh, the actual model uh, to estimate past parallel extent of the glacier. In addition to that, what really happens is as glaciers come to the town, they normally come towards the flag. What, what you will have is when you wait a bit, and all the time, because the glacier level, the glacier tends to make the topography gentle. They make it less slowly. And as it comes down the valley, they will they, they will be preserved with flat terrain. And if there is a flat and if there is a geography allows you, then uh, then it can get it wrong and form the lake, and which is called more than that. So there will be uh, or it can form near the terminus or just like what has happened in Uttarakhand, it can form in the other state coming from this side and then it can, this base of this pollen can erode and fall down and make the low lake which is adjacent. Then it is not called a more than lake, but it is also more than lake, not necessarily close to the glacier, but adjacent to the more than lake. So, it creates a geomorphology of its own and has the potential to have a big hazard. Uh, there are numerous cases of such hazards are there uh, and even uh, one has to be really very careful. So the, another thing we can happen is what will happen during the winter time? The winter time's entire region is covered by seasons because snow will fall for entire time. Because you know in a peak of summer, you will have a uh, uh, snow line with around 5,000 meters and when it comes to the peak of winter, uh, it comes in Manali. So what is that area of Manali? It's 1800, uh, 1850. So it comes near 2000. So uh, there is no very rare. It down also, but very there, but it is safely considered 2000 meters in the, in the altitude. So, enter this region with the world as well. Mm -hmm. And what will happen is as winter start progressing, snow line will start magging upward, and the time will come when uh, at the end of summer it will reach a certain height, mm -hmm. which is around 5000 meters or maybe something like that. And this is called a snow line at the end of summer. And otherwise, it is also called as equilibrium. Hmm? So it is an equilibrium line, you can say, for all the time at the end of summer, and it is extensively used to do the glacial mass balance. That means how much glacier has lost mass uh, will depend upon the altitude of this snow line at the end of summer, and there is a physical basis for that, and it means if this is considered as zero degree isothermal. Mm -hmm. And that means wherever there is annual zero degree isothermal atmospheric temperature, the possibility of coinciding this equilibrium line. That, however, fail. Remember, this is a tough rule, not necessarily applicable all the time, depending upon, it also depends upon the accumulation of snow. If we assume that accumulation of snow is because of the natural snow falling process, but we already know that it can be modified significantly because of the availability and can add error in the event. So you need to understand this. So how it looks like? Just look at this. That uh, before going into the other issues, I really want you to understand how it looks like. Uh, like this is part of the Patio Glacier. You can see. That this is the moraine, the actual moraine which is coming down, this is coming down, and this is the snout. You can see snout which is uh, here, you can see here, and, uh, and there is a snow which is on the surface. So you can see that on the side, like in the top, this is very different. You know, because how you look on the ground and how you look on satellite, the same thing is very different. And you need to understand and appreciate that. You can see here, same taxi glacier, it's just as over here, and, and this is uh, seasonal snow. And uh, I don't this, this is one of these four satellites, like special version. So we have a look into the issue, like I said, I've organized the American glacier, seasonal glacier, need to have a look into the issue. But I would like to move now further. And 
try to explain uh, some of the processes which involve in the formation of the glaciers. And you can see that what uh, this is the idea diagram of the glaciers, how uh, snow is going to get converted into ice and how ice is going to flow down the land. What happens to that? If we can understand it, then you will be able to move uh, and uh, use satellite remote sensing for glaciers. Now let us look into first thing, which is you have a very high altitude area or the center of the Greenland ice sheet huh? or center of the Antarctic ice sheet where a large amount of snowfall is there and on the surface there is no melting at all. That means you don't receive enough energy uh, from sun to melt. So there is no surface melting and the temperature predominantly below minus 10, minus 15 degrees Celsius and there is absolutely no melting, which is called a dry snow. So there is no uh, uh, in Himalayas, there is no dry snow uh, because even if you go very high altitude, there is a melting on the surface, but there is no dry snow in Himalaya, but there is dry snow zone in Greenland and Antarctica, hmm? as well as many places in polar regions where you have that. So what will happen is in order to convert this snow into ice, it takes very long time. So you can see, see here that you have a huge uh, uh, snow there and the amount of snowfall is also very large, slow, uh, very less. Uh, probably you understand the relationship between the temperature and a moisture in that by now. And because of that, the temperature remains substantially below freezing the amount of snow on the moisture and it's also in atmosphere place. And it is and as you go further down into the valley glacier, what is going to happen is there will be certain amount of and this line is called dry snow line. And as you go down, there will be certain amount of melting on the surface will take place. Hmm? And as you melt on the surface, as it moves downward, it refreshes again. Hmm? Because the temperature of snow is a bit of freezing, and whatever is melting with water, it refreshes and increases the temperature of snow. Hmm? And a uh, huge amount of latent heat is transferred. So you have now percolation zone over here. And key is this percolation zone is not contributing anything into the runoff. Hmm? Because whatever is melting on the surface is completely consumed to increase the density of snow in it below. So there is no actually runoff taking place. So it is important to understand that all regions which are melting not necessarily contributing into the runoff. So understanding that is very important. And but you will come into place at a time where this is at the uh, uh, since this is um, this is a snow ice surface, you can see it can reach point where the complete snowpack is wet. Hmm? That means the snowpack is completely from top to bottom, snowpack up to the bottom of the ice is wet. And, and such regions start contributing uh, water electricity runoff. So this is known as very snow line. So it is important uh, because when you see, when you see from satellite, you are not going to see whatever is happening in the bottom. What we are uh, in the cross section, you are going to see only surface. Hmm? So important question is whether we will be able to identify these lines, dry snow line, wet snow line. And as we move down the line, then we will have a significant very <coughs> very small zone. And when you come over here, this is where the snow, seasonal snow ends and ice is exposed on the surface. Hmm? So this line, which is called 
equilibrium line. And uh, there is a above equilibrium line, it's called accumulation area, and there is a below equilibrium line, it's called ablation area. Why it is called ablation area? Because ice is exposed to the surface and ice has very low albedo compared to snow, so it absorbs a lot of energy and most of the stream runoff, which is sweet the downstream, is generated wherever there is exposure of ice is there and therefore it is called ablation area. And this is called accumulation area essentially because it converts snow into the ice. So it accumulates the ice and therefore it is called ablation. But in between, you see, there is one thing, this. <coughs> what it is? It is called superimposed ice. You see, one of the three uh, first thing which uh, I have argued in, in, uh, in uh, it is, is uh, Himalayan glaciers do not have the superimposed ice zone. What it means is, as there is a huge amount of ice, uh, snow, it melts and it comes down. Uh, it's a density becomes a substantial yeah, higher. Hmm? And uh, then it will have uh, snow, which is, in, which is in the form of fur, that means it will have density, which is around 500 uh, kg per meter cube. Uh, and there's a lot of ice particles, big, big ice particles in between that. So if you look into the reflector, reflectors of ice, and the reflectance of the to the ice is not different. It is the same. So it is, it is very difficult to separate these two lines, that is the, this low line and equilibrium line by using remote sensing method. However, our volume of ice snow is not large, and most of it, because of the heavy venting, this superimposed ice is not generated into the uh, Himalayan terrain, it is predominantly generated into the polar regions. And um, uh, polar regions, because of that we do not have. So these two lines, no line, and equilibrium line merges together. And there is only one line, there are not two lines in Himalaya. That is one of the earlier arguments, uh, made and still it holds. So what it is there, now tells you is that if we can monitor uh, the snow line throughout the summer, they can, you can get this equilibrium line. And which separates between accumulation and the area, and which has a definite relationship with the mass balance of the glacier. That means you will able to tell how much glacial mass is lost every year if we are, if we are able to get this equilibrium line. So that is, that is the idea. Now look into the reflection curve. We have already seen it, how the snow, ice, contaminant you know, snow and vegetation and we can see now how we can identify this feature on the satellite images. Mm, that is the key because uh, we can even so you can see here that first important thing is how you can we already know the snow which have, and in this particular case we have used which satellite band should have used in this some of you have work on the list for which satellite band would have what kind of Component it is. Hmm? Which one? Which band? Both. 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 Uh, vegetation, uh, which is those dietation which is given because it has very high uh, reflectors in uh, near the infrared and it is being given to you can see here clearly and you can see the ice uh, has a very different look and you can see snow over here uh, which is very distinct and you can see this maximum extent of glacier over here which tells you about uh, past glaciation in this feature and the ice, uh, you can also see the initiated by where the ice has been located. So these are the features you can see, you can see better. Yeah. Um, so we already discussed, we will not go into the differentiation between glacial and non glacial in India, which can be done very easily in phosphor composite because of the distinct spectral reflectance characteristics. However, 
we have to be a little bit careful because now the issues are much easier to do because we have a digital elevation models uh, using different satellite um, uh, has already given you, you can use it, you can support it more daily on satellite images uh, and uh, get the ice divide or glacier divide. Uh, so this is the one way of doing it. Uh, and you can see here uh, very clearly you can mark the ice which is on the surface, expose and snow over surface on the exit. And if if this is the imagery at the end of summer, then you can delete the equilibrium uh, equilibrium line of this. Like this. Hmm? Uh, this is the ice. Uh, this is what you can see here. Uh, then also you can see other things like in the uh, and this, uh, this is ice uh, which is on the surface and there is a significant amount of debris cover come and fall on it. And which makes it difficult for you to delineate between the rock and ice. And we require different tricks uh, to do that. And you can see here this ice form of barometric glacier, the huge amount of uh, uh, ice is there and which is also covered by a uh, lot of debris. So what it makes it very see from the top, most of the ice is covered by debris and it makes very difficult to use only spectral reflectors as a parameter uh, to differentiate between snow and ice uh, or differentiate between glacier ice uh, and uh, land and where is the terminus of the glacier. So we by the way treatment geomorphological understanding. So actually the interpretation is also significant amount of geomorphological understanding is also needed and you can see in the past also you can reach like that. So one of the key things which you can do it if it is a huge glacier like the Gambotri glacier which has around 100 meters terminus uh, something like that and, it, it, and if it is a strategically located because it is uh, uh, towards the uh, north, uh, northeast, uh, is this north facing in the other, it creates a certain amount of shadow. So you can use the shadow as a criteria for the elimination of where the glacial point. Hmm? So each glacier will provide you with different and unique opportunity to delineate uh, this point. Therefore, it is necessary for you to understand your morphology of the region. Uh, and then try to, so you can see here that this stream is coming very clearly and you can see whether it ends, there is a shadow in here and this is suggesting that it is better than this. So we need to add certain things and if you apply this, then you are adding certain errors into it. So that error estimation has to be done into this. So you can see how it looks like that uh, that is uh, because this is the lake, which is the near term. Some of the top glacier, uh, which is in uh, Chandra Valley, uh, in my interpretation, you can see there is a lake. So, what it can do also is sometimes terminus of glacier is associated with the water. And if it is associated with the water, then you can easily and nicely delineate the glacial point. So, trick of monitoring glacier by using remote sensing is identify glacier which can be monitored by human. Many times people do the mistake. They take the glaciers which cannot be identified remote sensing and they say I cannot monitor. Hmm? So I always argue try to monitor something which can be monitored. Now don't don't do all our initiatives and say that all the glaciers we can monitor by using remote sensing and say that no, you cannot monitor all glaciers. But substantial number of glaciers can be monitored by remote sensing. And stick to those glaciers and then tell because nobody expects you to monitor all Himalayan glaciers and tell what is happening. People are expecting you to monitor key glaciers and tell how they represent the larger. So you have to be careful about that. So this unique opportunity you can be provided uh, in there. And you can see on satellite images how clearly you can see. So this is the same image as you can see on the ground. And you can see here that this is water body which is adjacent and this is ice.
which is coming very clear, and you can take the initiation for it. And how this initiation has changed for a period of time, 1989 to 2006, you can monitor it. When the last initiation, there could be an interesting issue in interpreting this retreat with the climate or change in mass. Hmm. I don't know whether we will move further up to that climb, uh, uh, up to that extent, but one of the key issues is the size of the glacier. The very large glacier, because uh, they have a large volume, they respond slowly to change in mass. Uh, and then uh, you will know that by this, uh, by looking into the Patterson equation, which you will not go in back, but Larger than the glacier, it is going to respond slowly to the change. Smaller than the glacier, it is going to respond faster. However, there could be various other complex issues in it. Uh, it is not simple and one of the complex issues in the cover of the Delta system. That means you can see here, this is a terminus of Parmati glacier and it is completely covered with debris. You do not know where is the debris and what is really happening because this is until now understood that Himalayan glaciers are not significantly retreating just like in Alps or in um, Rockies uh, in America. Uh, essentially because our glaciers are significantly covered by debris. And if you have a large debris cover, which is a couple of meters from ice surface, then solar radiation should reach to the regime on the top of the debris are not reaching towards the ice and which is acting as an insulator. However, uh, it can produce very different kind of phenomena. We will try to explore that phenomena in Himalaya. What can happen? What can happen to the ice body, uh, which is at the bottom and near terminus, is completely covered by the ice, but higher elevation is not covered by the what will happen? This is an important question and you need to understand this question. Uh, and today I will not go much detail uh, on this is, uh, because this is one of the fascinating expeditions which I have taken. Uh, and uh, when we decided to go to this glacier, how do I not know that the uh, hot is uh, because I was the time and I was much younger. We were working with the building and Calgary Khan in Sweden. Then I saw a glacier on satellite images which is retreating very fast, like almost 30 meters or 40 meters per year. And I asked my friend in the army, you know, can we go to this glacier? And then yes, the glacier is this one. We can always take wherever. And uh, we decided, and uh, without much gain, we thought. I landed at Manali and they told me for how many days like, you have come. I said, one day you said, no, no, it takes 10 days to walk there. So you better stay here for one month. So it is a long track. It is a 70 kilometer track from Manikaran uh, to go to this glacier and uh, to, um, what is that place? It's where it Mantarai. And there's one more day track from Mantarai onwards. Further down the line. And this is very famous part of the glacier, but it is very fascinating that track into uh, you enjoy that journey every day because you are you are trying all kinds of landscape. And uh, so what is really happening now is when we reach to that side, uh, when not a say first, you will remember how satellite can provide a clue to what is happening. Now you have a region which is over here, which is completely covered by debris. And on this region, there is very little debris, there is no debris at all. Mm -hmm. And this glacier is located at a very low altitude. I have a couple of papers on this, you can go through it in more detail. But what will happen is, you are creating a day ice It means that ice, which is now not connected with this imagination point. And this is not at all melting and going away because they are covered by huge debris. But, but it is not supplemented from and it is not moving. So by definition, 
such an eyes, eyes body which is not moving cannot be called as a glitch. Because this eyes body, what you can see here, they are disconnected from main, main eyes body and they are not moving. So they are over a period of time, they will remain wherever they are and they are going to make uh, with time. Uh, but now we shifted this place. Hmm? And this, so what is this is a new phenomenon happening in Himalaya is that the huge amount of uh, uh, day ice zone is created into the lower region if glacier is sufficiently large and active ice is moving back uh, quite fast. And now of that what is also going to happen is there are a huge amount of lateral glaciers are also coming. So you have a fragmentation of glaciers which is and so this is huge thing is happening, but they will, up to certain extent, can prolong demise of glacial ice. Hmm? But definitely, uh, uh, we, uh, they are not going to get protected unless the climate around that is not quite difficult. So, uh, now we talk about ice divide and accumulation area. We have discussed this issue, and this, this is something which you can see that how that part of the glacier is. This is a complete glacier, you can see, huge glacier, and once now this area which we are talking about here, and this is one glacier, this is another glacier, third glacier, fourth glacier. So, over a period of time, this glacier was up to this point. So this one glacier is now split into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 6 glaciers. So it is possible that that is why it is important for you to understand the number of glaciers are not important. Many times people will always ask you a question, how many glaciers are in Himalaya? Our oh, Bangalore Azure inventory have said 5,000 glaciers, your rural inventory is saying 9,000 glaciers. So, so there cannot be a unique number for a number of glaciers, but area has to be you know, compared. So uh, that is the most stable parameter is the area, not the number of glaciers. So we, you should not be, it should be surprised if you see different inventory comes with the different numbers. But they should not come up with a large variation in area because I think we all they have to add together. So now we have discussed accumulation area, we have discussed vibration area, we have also discussed the transient and equilibrium flow line. Now we will move a little bit further and try to understand what will happen if there is a temperature around it. Is it possible for us by using remote sensing to monitor the temperature or not? Hmm? That is the key question. We have seen the spectral and we have seen that uh, a rock has a low reflectance in visible region and high reflectance in square region. That is a short wave for a reason. So you can see here, you can clearly identify the physical region of the glacier, and this is where the snow and ice is on the surface, and these are the region where the is on the surface, and you can mark the rain. And this is the rock. So if you use the geomorphology in combination, with spectral characteristics, it is possible for you to differentiate between the uh, debris on the glacier and all ice. Because I always say that many times people want to interpret glaciers by using mathematical techniques. But there are some limitations of mathematical techniques. Unless you incorporate geomorphology into this, it will be very difficult for you to know that there is a model of glaciers. And that is important. Uh, we have discussed more than uh, 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 that and that is how glaciers in total fly into the Himalaya. If you look into this, it's a beautiful photograph which I have taken of some of the top glaciers. Uh, and you can see that this accumulation area over here. And I don't know, actually, uh, normally we are able to say active versus inactive ice also on this photograph. It looks like uh, uh, we don't have proper lightning. So you can see here this is a snow which is on the surface, accumulation area, this is aggression area, the ice is on the surface. Hmm? 
uh, and with a significantly different tone because of the heavy that is covered on it. You can see the description nature, which is completely different from this. And you can see the morning, which I was talking to you earlier, that glacial morning, this is the glacial morning. So remember, in the past, this glacial was up to this height. And this change in altitude is not in meters, it is hundreds of meters. So there is a huge deglaciation has taken place in this media, and this is where the water body is formed. So it has potential to form this big, bigger body, body, not necessarily now it is formed, but it can form in future, and uh, this is how uh, glaciers typically looks like. And we need to. Uh, uh, okay, therefore, we have talked about this. And we have now seen, uh, we have already talked about this issue is because uh, it has very different um, reflective characteristics, particularly in uh, you can see debris here have a reflector, very low reflector is visible, which you can make high reflector spherical, and you change the band combination and how it looks like. Here it is, uh, when you are for standard for scalar composite, it has a different uh, color tone, and if you make it, uh, if you use the sphere pattern, you can see, and here it is, you can know how much area is covered by the region, and this region is not covered by the region. So, wherever you get the red tone, and you can convert this into NDSR, and you can convert it into the smarter algorithm, about which we will not go right now, but you can. This is, it has now, it, you can see that it has the potential and it has a scientific basis to differentiate between snow, ice, debris covered snow, and water. So, and we divide now the shape and size of it that we give more for it. So, if you combine all this thing, it is possible for you to monitor glacier uh, and uh, it is in no place and but still people are working on it, uh, particularly how to uh, um, delineate a glacier boundary. Automatically, it means you require slope and other parameters. So there's a lot of huge work is going on in this direction, and there is definitely scope for many of you to contribute in automatic delineation of glacial extent, particularly the body. And why it is important? Because it is when you give the loss in India over a period of time, since the different people are going to work over a period of time, there is always uncertainty associated with the human interpretation. So if we can avoid that uncertainty, we can gain better estimate of change in area. And change in area is a key parameter to understand uh, uh, future availability of water in the Indian uh, system. So, therefore, this change in glacier and associated with the change in temperature is key parameter. So, you can see here how we can use uh, change in band combination to delineate the debris cover. And, and another key thing is also that a depth of debris cover uh, and because what you can if you change the band combination, what you can get on the surface whether they get the debris cover or not. But you want to know what is this change because if at all you want to convert this into the amount of rain, hmm? so you know how much is incoming solar radiation on the surface. You want to know how much that incoming radiation is actually transferred to the surface of the glacier ice. And that will depend upon two parameters. One parameter is the type of rock, where it has thermal properties, and the depth of rock on it. Mm -hmm. So, type of rock you can, uh, in the geology of the region, will define, but the depth will vary from place to place on the region. So, the techniques which is used, uh, which we are using, is ground penetrating radar. How many of you are familiar with the ground penetrating radar? Radar, how many of you know the radar? Yeah. Yes. Which, which region of spectrum you use? Yes. Huh? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so what happens is you have um, uh, okay, radio, radio, whatever you name it. 
So you actually move towards the longer the wavelength hmm? uh, and then you have around uh, 100 megahertz in the frequency and if you have that you take it to the, on the glacier and you uh, estimate so it will not penetrate much and you can get the debris cover and all this so you can see here the debris cover is very from almost a half a meter to a meter on a glacier. So you can use, and if you change your frequency, instead of 100 megahertz, if I go to 10 megahertz, or 5 megahertz, then it will penetrate completely into the, um, into the glacier ice, and it is possible for you to get the depth of glacier. So that is one way of doing it and you can see here how this can affect the matrix because everything is important because I was talking to you about matrix and you can see that how matrix is changing and matrix is as to uh, in centimeter and the height of uh, you can see how matrix is at the lowest point of glacier and you there we are supposed to have a very high metric as we move down into the planet, but you can see here, metric is almost zero. Hmm? And it will go up, up, as we move on to on the higher altitude, and as we increase the peak. So for ice cap, we have to think about 900 meters, at 4,200 meters, you have a large metric. And this inversion of the curve is caused because of the debris. Which otherwise you might be like this. Hmm? Now this is the inversion, and from here on, when the ice is exposed on the surface, you can see again this goes up. So this is the influence of many on many due to debris cover. So uh, that is why we say that glacial the lower niches are protected as natural. So this is uh, how I learned. How oh, it influences topography because Himalayan glaciers are steep slope. So what you observe on um, uh, what you observe and what actually happens in ground, these are two different things. So you the simple economics, uh, but this I have tried to say in the context of um, change in height uh, because uh, suppose you you take the situation where you have equilibrium line, you know the equilibrium line. Hmm? What is it? Hmm? It's a regular and it's a joint equilibrium. Correct. Or it is more like a triangle. Correct. Hmm? Now, if there is a change in temperature uh, by 1 degree or 2 degree Celsius, hmm? Its influence on glacial mass loss will not be uniform. It depends upon hmm, geomorphological conditions. Hmm, and why is that? One of the other dis discussions we have discussed in this equilibrium line is nothing but the zero degree isotope. Correct, uh, uh, it is, uh, that is where the mean triangle temperature is zero degrees Celsius. So it is zero degrees Celsius. Also, in you know, a some way you can characterize, not strictly. So if there is a rising temperature by one degree or two degrees Celsius, just like the last step in, uh, uh, in an environmental landscape, they can break either them up into that atmosphere, temperature also reduces. Correct? Likewise, as uh, temperature rises, this equilibrium line will also go up. Hmm? Now, an important question suppose it is going up 500 meters. Hmm? What will happen? Now, if it depends upon what is going to happen, if that 100 meter is on steep slope or that 100 meter is on gentle slope. Hmm? Depending upon that, you may know how much area can be converted into a inclination in a inclination. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, you have that. 
No, we don't have that. Uh, let me take it. Uh, let me take it, please. Suppose this slide. You have this region which is extremely steep. Hmm? And if it's 100 meter upward shift, it may not mean much geographical area we will move from glacier or move from accumulator. But in both these regions, if now this is a glacial region we are here, then we are in the extreme flat. Hmm? And 100 meters with large geographical area will be taken up from accumulation area to accumulation area and mass balance will substantially collapse. So it is now small change will in temperature will have different impact on different glaciers depending upon its geomorphology, depending upon its area that you can do. We can quantify it, we can mathematically put it, I'm just giving you a physical concept about it. So that is why there was huge controversy in IPCC, which many of you have uh, know that IPCC in last report. How many of you know IPCC? All of you know that. I think you should know it. They say that Himalayan glaciers are going to vanish by 2035. Last time it became a major national controversy. Why did it become precise because of this thing? If I have not those who are arguing, they have not understood. They were looking at the one glacier and saying that this can happen to one glacier, therefore it can happen to all glaciers. So we need to understand this thing that impact of change in temperature will vary from glacier to glacier and region to region. And therefore, we require very decent modeling techniques to do it. So, this is one thing, this we have looked into that. Uh, and then the depth, we have looked into this depth, and you can see here, this is one of the uh, glacier depth. And this is a small patch of glacier which has a depth uh, by using, I was discussing you earlier, by using, it has around 35 meters depth, nearly 10 meters, uh, not a very high altitude. But beyond that, it is very difficult to use it. But now, we will, from here, we will, I will I'll talk to you another 10 minutes of very different issue about about Asia. The first question, many of you who are coming from South, Deep South, in India, must be thinking, where are the Asians? Hmm? Where they are located? And why everybody, uh, why it has become obsession of the place in North India? Hmm? Uh, that is why uh, it is important for you to know. Predominantly, if you look uh, into the major Indian rivers, such as Indus, uh, the Indus, the river, the Brahmaputra, and Ganga, they all originate in a high altitude Himalayan region. And uh, their water supply, particularly in summertime, is replenished because of the snow and glacier melt. Therefore, they become available, otherwise, they would have become seasonal streams the way our Krishna or Kaveri are there. We have to have a huge dams supply water. They don't have that dams uh, essentially because nature has provided North India with want that means you have. During winter time, snowfall, it makes the summer time and subsequently monsoon arrives. So, the time when we don't have any blanket snow and glacier melt. And that has been sustained our civilization for generations. Uh, and therefore, it is important for us to know what is going to happen to that water, particularly in critical summer months. And then, the glaciers are not everywhere. The entire line mass of Himalaya is not covered by glaciers. They are restricted along the mountain range, yes? And the first mountain range which is glacial ice is the Peer Panjal mountain range. And uh, as you move uh, from, um, uh, from south, and you go to, uh, if you have traveled to the Manali, that first mountain range on the back of Manali is the Peer Panjal mountain range. These are the range, southern side and northern side, both are occupied by glaciers. Uh, this is the Sri Punjab, another is the Great Himalayan mountain range. That is also occupied by glaciers. There are huge glaciers here and there. And subsequently, you have another 
a small small mountain and it's like layer but the Karakul mountain ridge which is high in glacier life and that is where the Sayachin glacier is there which is one of the largest glacier in this part of the world uh, so you have mountain uh, ranges uh, on the both side that mountain ranges you have glaciers and in between the lands and there are streams in between like you have China which is flowing in between this or whether you have Indus which is flowing over here or whether you have Ganges which is coming out like this so you have uh, you also like that so uh, that is how it looks like uh, and, to, and what is really happening to these glaciers? are they betrayed? because there is a huge controversy and huge issue so we do not know because what they really have to say humanitarianly very complex and difficult to go and uh, because of that, um, even though we have approximately 40,000 square kilometer area, glaciers in Himalaya, which is called the whole of the glacier, and uh, maybe 9,000, so not 10,000 glaciers are there, but not all can be visited by the human being. And we uh, have a modern scientific instrument to go and visit. But there are almost 85 glaciers now, uh, of which the largest that is available and which is published in the literature and which is approximately 5 and uh, around 600 meters is a ridge and then except probably one glacier one or two glaciers almost all glaciers are ridge see that is the we have it's quite possible that uh, you can uh, that is what in older days we used to say you can have opinion and you can discover glaciers build that opinion uh, you can always argue that Himalayan glaciers are not literate. Take this argument and look for a 20 glacier which is stable. It's possible. You say that Himalayan glaciers are advanced. I can give you 20 glaciers which is searching here which is advanced. Hmm? And you can say Himalayan glaciers are literate. I can give 100 glaciers which is literate. But the important question is you, do, you should understand in science. And finally, if they are advancing, why they are advancing? And it is because of searching, why they are searching? Because the internal dynamic change into the glacier, it has nothing to do with the climate. So this understanding has to be there. So it is very confusing science, and people are very confused, and depending upon the evidence, they keep on giving argument, but you have to be uh, very careful with the argument with all kinds of data. Uh, so, then how much is the loss in India? Because we have seen now it is possible by more sensing using nature to estimate the loss in glacial area. So you can see here we have approximately 40,000 square kilometer area into the Himalayas, uh, which is all part of Himalaya, which is the Karakura, uh, Western Himalaya, Central Himalaya. Um, and Eastern Himalaya, which includes the Himalaya Bhutan, as well as the third portion of the Tibetan Plateau, we have approximately 40,000 square kilometers. Out of that, already 11,000 square kilometers area is already monitored by different people and different workers throughout the world. Um, uh, there are people in France, there are people in Switzerland, they all are the people they have. And then now we have. From 1960s to 2000, we have lost almost 13% geographical area in the glacier. This is uh, now we can see the surface with all these areas. Then, how much is loss in glacial mass? Huh? Difficulty in uh, uh, Himalayan terrain is we have approximately 9,000 glaciers, hmm? and estimation of glacial mass is really tough business. What means you need to go and stay there for three months mm -hmm. and uh, you have to reach to 6,000 meters, sit there at the mm -hmm. and, and then you require a large number of people who can support those people who are sitting there. They can't sit simply like that. You require food and food, you have to evacuate them if they fall sick. Uh, we have to provide medical support, all kinds of support. So, by any standard, Malaysia, Mahadana study is a major investment, major enterprise. Uh, and therefore, we do not have many initials which are being monitored, and globally, there are not more than 
30-35 years monitor the tumor and the mineral tumor the 60 years monitor. On top of that, nobody wants to continue with the same patient for long period. People change, idea, people change, cancer, so they want to move from one glacier to another glacier and as people become old, they want to go to simpler glaciers. Uh, so when they are young, idealistic, they take a very difficult glacier, as they go old, still uh, they find they cannot do anything else, so they continue to do but look for a smaller glacier, so to keep on changing the glacier. And you change in glacier, then we don't have continuity of our balance for long period of time. So we have two difficulties. One difficulty is the number of glaciers are less and you have a discontinuous record. Uh, so you, we try to go into one of those records, one of those address, issue address. If there is a discontinuous record, what you do with that glacier? We have tried to go into this. This is say Chota Shibi, Hamsa, Adara, Gorga, Ramachani, Adara, Dukri and Chorabali glacier. We try to run that that um, loss in um, time uh, gap by using ELA and AM, about which I was talking to you earlier, how to estimate the equilibrium line altitude and uh, convert the equilibrium line altitude into a cumulative ratio and get the glacial multiple. I'm going to not talk much about that but it's not sufficient time. Uh, so you can do it and we have done it and said. Approximately for these glaciers, seven eight glaciers, we have lost from uh, mid 70s almost 20 meters of glacial thickness. So it is substantial loss, uh, but even though this is only in lower glaciers. Another key issue is what has happened to the rate of entry. Because earlier time we have seen from mid 60s how much is it lost, but whether it is actually, uh, whether the history from the 60s to now, whether they care, whether it is actually. And if they are accelerating, what is really happening in the ground? Are there new processes or new phenomena taking place which accelerate this rate? So one thing is that we have looked into two bases. One is in Basta basin, uh, which is located in the central mother, which is uh, which is in the Pradesh and in the north of Nagoji um, Glacier and Nagoji Valley, and you can see the glacier retreat is accelerating. Another thing we have to do is start this is the city, and that is there also accelerating. So we have two geographically different regions of Himalaya one is in central Himalaya, one is in eastern Himalaya, and the both of the places, rate of retreat of glaciers is accelerated, and why is that? Let us look into both the places, it is working in very different fashion. Uh, uh, Studies suggest there could be a different issue at different places. Let us look into the issue of glacial retreat in Sikkim Himalaya. And you can see here from 1990, the glacier is completely covered by debris. Uh, you can see here the red toe and the small, small water body which started to fall. There was a period of time, the water body has become uh, bigger and bigger and eventually it becomes a stable water body. By 2010, the stable and big Morin Dam Lake is formed. So, what is really happening now? The, because of the geomorphology of the stele, Sikki Himalaya, large number of uh, glaciers which was earlier covered by debris, and people thought debris covered with glaciers are going to get protected, and they are not going to get retreated. And such glaciers are now experiencing the formation of modern time lake, and which is significantly increasing in So the present rate of retreat, so the cycle of glacier, earlier people thought will end with the uh, debris cover is not the end of that cycle. This can lead to the formation of the debris cover and significantly increase the debris. So there is no currency or there is no protection in saying that the debris cover these glaciers are going to get protected. Time will come, they may enhance the energy retreat. Uh, Another key problem which the many of us in Central Himalaya is facing is because of the black hat. Uh, we will not give a complete treatment to this issue because there is a lot of um, 
broadly in other issues are involved in it. But we try to understand what is happening a particular year in 2009, and it's probably happening every year, that we know that uh, Indonesia has experienced a large amount of uh, agricultural learning, particularly at the end of April and the beginning of May. At the same time, there is a huge amount of forest fire also takes place in the hills uh, of Himalaya. Or hills of Himalaya. Yeah. So you can see here, uh, this is a particular one year. Uh, you can see every year uh, there is a huge forest fire, but 2009 is a special year. And you can see that suddenly the forest fire has significantly gone up. Why it has gone up? Because that was a drought year, the arrival monsoon was significantly less. Or and because of that, forest fire has gone up, and we try to look into how it has affected the reflection of the snow. And you can see here, uh, the, the large geographical area, if you take not about the glacier area, large geographical area, and look into the how reflections have changed from the beginning, uh, uh, from the middle of the day to the beginning of the day. And you can see that in the center, in 2009, there was a sudden drop of snow reflection. This does not, uh, and then I uh, try to use it to edit data and see how much drop in reflector. So you can see that uh, there is uh, the, the accumulation in your glacier, uh, which is above 5,000 meters, there is a significant drop in reflector snow. You have to remember the number of things in this. As snow elevation changes, the change in snow elevation is an irreversible process. What it means? It means it can never come back to the original value. And why is it happening? Because the change in fundamental property of snow is changes, this changes in grain size. And the inverse relationship between the grain size and the altitude. Higher is the grain size, lower the hmm? uh, So because of that, on top of that, hmm, there is also many process in say. So you have an earlier melting process starting. If you start in the melting process at 5,000 meters, as in April we said, there's a possibility of fast reduction in our glowing also there. Uh, so this process becomes completely irreversible and it has potential to reduce mass balance quite significantly unless there is a fresh snowfall in the sea. That means if there is a fresh snowfall, then this can be covered. So if you have, it's quite possible that we need to understand this dynamics completely that once the monsoon arrives hmm, uh, then this region can still experience snowfall and uh, whatever is the uh, uh, contaminated black carbon contaminated snow can go the below the fresh snowfall and still be on a higher level. But this dynamics needs to be understood and this dynamics can, can change from year to year. So its influence is neither going to be permanent nor it can be ignored completely. So it, it requires a complex monitoring because this particular problem which has to be monitored, not just by a lot of model and target. You need to monitor it also problem. So this is really an influencing the Asia. We still do not know how much it is influencing, uh, but it is influencing and we need to look into the issue very carefully. And understand. Another key issue which we have looked into is that what will happen um, if there is a change in temperature and precipitation in the environment. Hmm? That is, uh, uh, and you can see here, there are, there are numerous ways you can know how temperature and precipitation are used, and in this particular case, we have used the CP5 uh, where. Um, uh, we have an ensemble uh, product, an ensemble product, and we have said that how under different scenario, that R C P uh, 2.6, uh, 4.5, 6, and 8.5. I will not go into that because I'm sure that a lot of people will talk about that. Have they talked about this? Uh, what they, what the Bala lecture and other lectures, they will talk about that. Then how we get all about uh, So what is, uh, uh, you get, what you can see here that under different scenario, average temperature will change from 2.2 uh, to 2.36, uh, 
a different time, uh, up in like 2018s, 2015s, and 2030s, and it can also change in RCP 8.65, which is the worst case scenario, the 2.25 to 5.51. So it's quite possible, depending upon what kind of um, uh, road humanity will be taken in the future, we do not know how humanity is going to take the road in the future, but we know it can change. A uh, temperature by 2080 can change from 2.3 to 5.5 degrees Celsius. We do not know what is going to happen, but anything can happen in between this range. And what it means is we can convert that change in temperature and change in precipitation by using the equilibrium line altitude about which I was talking to you earlier and getting area attitude distribution of glacier. We will know that we can estimate the mass balance, which is the current mass balance, and mass balance under climate change conditions. Uh, this you can do. Uh, there are different, uh, uh, some of our paper is short coming out, and you can know how it is the line is going to change with time in different parts of Himalaya, Kalamba, uh, Western Himalaya, Central Himalaya, uh, Eastern Himalaya. But one of the key things which you should understand is this is. Look at the Karakoram Himalaya. As of now, Karakoram still has a positive mass balance. Look at this. So this is still your equilibrium line is below the maximum area. So large geographical area in Karakoram is still under accumulation area compared to the eastern Himalaya, which has a very large area, which is the under uh, accumulation area. So what it means? It means that these glaciers are stable hmm? and in a present scenario they are not significantly retreating and eastern Himalaya they are retreating. They are moving mass very fast and uh, central Himalaya also they are losing and uh, western Himalaya are also worse now. What is going to happen is small change. So what has happened now is if there is a small change in equilibrium altitude, it will have the largest impact in the western Himalaya as compared to the eastern Himalaya. Because eastern Himalaya, we already crossed that boundary, we have reached up. So glaciers are anyway going to lose large area. And in western Himalaya, we have now, if we are able to stabilize, we have potential to protect quite significant number of glaciers. We have lost that opportunity in Eastern Himalaya, and we are also probably lost that opportunity in Central Himalaya as well. Uh, so this is kind of understanding you can develop on regional scale by, by this kind of analysis and see what is going to happen in that. And what at the end it means is how it is going to change. That is, if you 2030 under different scenario. We are losing almost 70 meters, and with the RCP 8.5, we can lose at uh, one meter glacialized temperature. So, depending upon um, scenario, depending upon precipitation, we can model this thing. So, this is uh, frontline research you can continue to do. You can convert this into statistical model, and then you can convert it to energy balance model, and numerous things you can do it. So, there is a huge scope uh, for you to use uh, remote sensing and the uh, numerous other geomorphology in, 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 in glaciology uh, and uh, maybe I have not talked about it, uh, I was just talking to you about the physical concept behind doing the work, not mathematical for or modeling part. Uh, I'm sure it's bring you some attraction towards this field and uh, you are having any questions that we have. If we have played this. Thank you, yes. Very good. This time I have a bright breakfast. No questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
So we will have very different dynamics. The first issue is to be trigonometry in nature. That means um, area which is on stiff flow huh? and uh, how much area will be on dry Hmm? Because when you look at the satellite images, you look on the image, which is on the ground of the So, it is a simple trigonometry, uh, and you can calculate that as slope increases, um, the geographical area on the steeper slope it shows lower relation to the ground of the This is a simple trigonometry. Another key issue comes in a, a slope is how much solar radiation is going to come. Really. So it depends upon, so if the making process will depends upon slope and also depends upon its orientation. That which, whether it is another orientation, another orientation, so, so incoming solar radiation will also change depending upon the orientation. Um, uh, so these are the uh, issues which will determine the nature, but which will be again a function of a couple of other things. That means as the depth discovers changes, it can be influenced because of that. Uh, if uh, if uh, uh, the, the water body, it will also define, uh, depend on that. Uh, on the size of the issues, because uh, you know that, uh, that if you apply the equation uh, continuity, uh, if there is, you will realize the larger is the thickness, uh, there's a, a, a longer time which is taken to react. Uh, so it is the response time. Question of response time is also there. So it is inversely related to the depth of the issue. So all this so is a huge science involved in a converting the temperature change into the glacial energy. Because first you need to convert the temperature change into change in mass. Uh, and change the mass into the glacier literally. Mm -hmm. So this is a complex business to do that. Uh, so many people don't understand and they try to uh, fumble on the way that uh, they say that many people. And another key issue also I want to tell you about mm, uh, selection of uh, satellite images is crucial. So let us look into some of the data which I have projected. The many initials are not trending at the rate of 10 meters per year. Hmm? So what many of you will do is uh, you will take this figure. Hmm? What is the special resolution of this? Thank you, three meters. So how many? Suppose you are doing a rate of five years and glacier is take at the rate of. Uh, 10 meters per year, so you have approximately 50 meters a tree. Hmm? So, minimum 4 5 pixels are needed to correctly identify the loss of glacial tree. So, you have actually if you, uh, 23 meters, 4 pixels means you have already gone more than 80 meters. Error. So, what it means is you cannot use these three data for 5 years or 10 years in tree. What will you buy in the next four years? So the selection of satellite, many papers, uh, if some of you are writing papers in this day, get rejected simply because of this kind of mistakes. Many of you do is that they will give the annual glacial retreat by giving you to them. And nobody will look at the paper there, so they will reject it. Well, it doesn't add into error. You know. Error analysis be the key part of the universe. So keep look at it and have a proper error, error analysis on what you are doing. And many times you don't do the error analysis. Many papers, I don't mean it is with you, but many papers which people write without doing error analysis. So I'm sure there are the first lecture and other lectures of error analysis. So look, look into those issues and the key in doing it. How can we protect the glacier in Western Himalaya? I don't know. That's a million dollar question. I hope we have some answer for that. <laughs> but I always feel it is a global problem. Huh? And 
and the total suffering. So, probably uh, something has to be done globally, but I don't know. There may be young people who can come up with a bright idea and say that you can do this thing and protect the nation. But simply, I have a constant mind, intellectual capacity to work on it. It's a problem for young people. Huh. Can we use the microwave remote sensing to study the morphology of this oh, thing? Of course we can. Microwave has large potential to use it and one of the key things which I am not talking uh, I am not talking about it. Uh, say, uh, what is the difficulty in understanding future change in Glacier? Is, um, what is the distribution of um, Glacier territory. Because if you really want to apply a question of continuity, we will require the maximum depth of glacier. Hmm. And if you apply the maximum depth of glacier, if you know the change in mass and if you know the flow, you can calculate the what is the future change in glacier length. Hmm. And then you can convert it into the area. But we do not have data from glacier. Uh, and how they can distribute it from one place to another place of the glacier. You can do it few glacier here and there, but that can be uh, still going to be a sample one. Now we cannot apply it for entire moment range. So now we have developed even a new technique uh, where we can get the velocity by using the more sensing method. That means where the microwave, in particular interferometry, can significantly use to estimate the velocity of the glacier. If we have the velocity of a glacier, and then if you know the uh, uh, slope of glacier, you can model the depth. Mm -hmm. That is a uh, uh, simple principle of geology you can apply. And you can model the depth. And we have uh, applied this uh, to the composite glacier. And the paper is going to be obtaining and now with this week of this week. Then we have given what is the distribution of the composite glacier, which is very confined and meters to 30 meters. Uh, so, uh, remote sensing has potential in that direction to understand the glacial dynamics. Remote sensing, uh, I know remote sensing has great potential, particularly to go the uh, seasonal snow and its density or water in them, which renewable uh, radiation has no potential at all. Uh, uh, there we need to model it by the pool here, you know, which could be misleading because of the contamination of black carbon or aerosol or tubers or something. So these are the, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and particularly those we have to be history manner which is preliminary cloud cover, we need to develop our work. But because of the rugged topography and the problem of naval and other, it's a complex business to use uh, microwave techniques. But there are many groups, I don't know where from here, you are coming from there. In NRSA. NRSA. Many groups, including in as well as Mobile, I think there's another area where people can, young people should invest their energy into it. Sure. Simple. No, no, no. 
complication. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we should wait for lunch now. Thanks a lot.